I am delighted to introduce now um, Dr. Robert Miranda. He's a colleague of mine from the Center for Alcohol and Addiction Studies at the Brown School of Public Health. Um, he's a very established researcher with expertise in working with adolescents with substance use and, co and co occurring mental health problems. And he's also just a really delightful guy to work with and a great speaker. So I hope you'll join me in introducing Dr. Miranda. Thank you, Sarah. <laughs> um, and thank you to everyone for coming this morning, and a, and a great thanks to everyone who organized this conference. I appreciate the invitation, and I'm excited to be here. Just want to make sure that I. All right, we'll see how this goes with the um, with the slides. So, um, in terms of this morning's talk, what I want to focus on is four parts. So the first is sort of the latest trends in adolescent substance use, and not only across the U.S., and some of you may be very familiar with this, but also comparing U.S. statistics with what you see here in Maine. The second part of the talk is going to focus on why adolescence is such a critical period um, in the development of substance use disorders, um, in terms of both the magnitude of the problem in adolescence, but also in terms of the implications of the onset of these problems in adolescence for long-term health over the course of the lifespan. The third part of the talk this morning is going to be focused on co-occurring disorders. And so for those of us who work with adolescents, um, we, <laughs> I'm not sure that we've ever seen someone without co-occurring disorders. So um, it's, it's a central part of, of what we do when we're treating adolescents with these problems. And then the fourth part of the talk will be focused on what the latest research tells us in terms of the be best available interventions. I have to do two clicks for everything, so I will get this down in about two minutes into this, I think. Um, so as Sarah said, I'm at the, uh, a little bit about me, I'm at the Center for Alcohol Addiction Studies at Brown University. Um, I'm also, uh, and, and in there I do research, I run a research program funded by NIH. I have since the mid-90s on adolescent substance use um, and some adult substance use. Uh, in addition, I'm uh, the director of mental health for a school department in Rhode Island, and, uh, and more recently, I've also taken on um, being the clinical director for an, an intensive outpatient program for kids with co-occurring disorders, um, substance use, and some other non-substance psychiatric disorder. So in terms of the learning objectives I have for this morning, um, they're sort of threefold. Um, the first is, I'd like you to be able to walk away here from this morning, um, being able to really speak to what the latest trends say about adolescent substance use, assuming that you don't already. Um, also be able to explain what the latest research says in terms of why adolescence is such a critical period in the development of addiction. Um, and, and I'll get into that a little bit because I think that there's some really exciting research happening across the country in this area. Um, and it's, I think it's really taken off in the last five to ten years or so. And then lastly, I really hope that you walk away being able to describe what are the key features of the best available interventions. In terms of taking back to your practice, what are the things that should certainly be a component of that practice in terms of at least what the research says? You know, and there is a gap between, oops, sorry, between research and what we, what we actually see in the clinic, and that gap is something that is actually oftentimes frustrating to me. But I think I'd like you to be able to at least take away what the research says in terms of what should be part of um, the best available interventions. So let's start with a slide that you probably are very familiar with, at least in the US. Adolescence is the peak period for the onset of, of substance use, um, not only in the US, but worldwide. So if you look across, and this is a recent study that came out in The Lancet, which is a very great journal, um, that looked at the peak onset of use across alcohol, tobacco, cannabis, and cocaine. So, so not just alcohol and not just pot. And looked at, you know, what are the peak onsets of the of use of these substances across the world? And what you see is there's striking similarity. So if you look here in the shaded area, this is the teenage years. And what you'll see is that there's this market increase, a huge spike um, that happens for almost all kids who are people that are going to end up using. The onset of that use almost always occurs during adolescence. And that's not just true in the US, and it's not just true for alcohol or marijuana. So adolescence, as Sarah very appropriately said, is a really peak point, a really opportune point for intervening, um, both in terms of early intervention, but also um, treatment. If we look at trends in lifetime substance use among 12th graders, and there's a million ways to look at this data, um, 
in terms of you can look at last month, you can look at trends lifetime. I think it's interesting to look at like, so how many 12th graders have used various substances? What you see for most substances um, is that there's a marked decline over the last 25 years. Um, this is true for alcohol. Um, alcohol actually is at an all-time low in terms of use um, in 2016. Um, it's true for um, illicit drugs. It's certainly true for cigarettes. There's been a, a very significant decline in cigarette use among adolescents over the last 25 years. Where it's not so true, and we can all guess this, where it's not so true is with marijuana. So if you look at just 2016 data, um, about half of kids by the time of 12th grade have used marijuana at least once. Um, about two thirds have used alcohol, um, and about a third have used cigarettes, with one out of five kids, which seems to me like a high number, having used illicit drugs. And when we look at lifetime opiate use and prescription use, and this speaks to something Sarah presented a little earlier, what we see is a similar sort of trend where there's been a decline over time, which is a little bit inconsistent with maybe what we see um, in terms of in the news and what we see in practice with kids that are young adults, a little older than adolescents. But in adolescents, the, the rates of heroin use, um, which have remained more or less stable but low, um, and then you have narcotics and, um, and prescription drug use, which has been on the decline. Now, prescription drug use is still high, but it has shown to be on the decline over the last um, decade or so. In, this, in the figure that you see here, actually, I'm not even advancing the slides. I knew I was going to not get that. Sorry, I apologize greatly. If I don't do that again, someone raise their hand and say, what are you talking about? Um, so anyhow, so here's the slide where there's a decrease in the cigarette use, um, which is sort of in the middle there. Um, this is the slide I'm talking about now, where you see that, um, so heroin um, is low, but has remained stable. Um, prescription drugs, um, which we started assessing in this survey probably around 2005, um, has shown overall a general decline, as well as, as narcotics. How about Maine? So how do kids in Maine compare to overall national averages? So in this slide, what we see is past month illicit drug use. So what we see is that the national average, and this is now we're looking at um, in terms of past month use among 12 to 17 year olds from 2010 until 2014, which is the last data wave. And what we see is about 10% of kids on average um, have used illicit drugs in the last month recreationally. Um, that amounts to about 10,000 kids in Maine in, in, in the most recent wave of 2013-14. What's notable here is, so in this context, uh, kids in Maine don't differ from national averages. When we look at past month binge drinking, um, here we're looking at kids who are underage drinkers, so 12 to 20 year olds. What we see is a very similar pattern where it hovers around 15% in terms of the number of kids who have engaged in binge drinking in the last month. Um, that leads to about 22,000 kids in your state. Um, and this percent hasn't changed over time since 2010, and it's not different than national averages. If we look at cigarette use, you see the decline I talked about before, even as recently just over the last few years. We see a significant decline from 2010 to 2014, um, with kids using, you know, about 5 to 7% of kids during that time have used uh, cigarettes in the last month. Um, and that's, again, not different from national averages. In terms of pain relievers uh, in the last month use, kids in, again, these are 12 to 17 years, so these are fairly young kids. About 4,000 kids reported non-medical use of pain relievers in the last month in, a, in, in the most recent data. And this, again, hasn't changed over time, so we haven't seen any reduction since 2010, and it's not significantly different than national averages. So overall, substance use is fairly common among kids. It's in, to some degree developmentally fairly normative. Um, when we look at, when we ask kids about how risky they think substance, uses, substance use is, um, and this is something we've done nationally, including in, in, in Maine, what we see, and this is, I think, is fairly alarming, eight out of 10 kids receive no major risk with using marijuana once a month. So if you ask just cross-sectional you know, survey of kids, the vast majority of kids say, see that there's nothing really wrong with, with using marijuana. And, and kids finding no problem with using marijuana, that has increased as legalization of marijuana has occurred across the country. When we look at alcohol, about two, two out of three kids, so 68% or so of kids, 
say that there's no real risk with binge drinking once or twice a week. Um, there's no real risk associated with that. Again, these are 12 to 17 year olds. And when we look at nicotine use, what we see is about one in three kids, about a, you know, so a third of kids, see that there's no real risk of, of, of smoking a pack of cigarettes or more a day. And when you look at how this compares to national averages, what you do see is that kids in Maine perceive less risk associated with marijuana use and alcohol use than kids nationally. Um, so while they're not necessarily using more for most substances, what they do see is there's less risk associated with, their, with that use. So this leads to the question, is adolescent substance use benign? A lot of kids use substances. Um, a lot of kids don't see that there's much problem with using those substances. So is it in fact problematic? And the answer, probably preaching to the choir, is that it in fact is problematic in a number of ways. And I'm just gonna highlight a few. Some of these have already been discussed this morning. So kids who use substances, and I'm not saying kids with substance use disorders, I'm saying kids who use substances, have lower educational attainment, um, and they have poorer school performance, and they're higher, they have a higher likelihood of dropout. These associations with, with education um, are reciprocal, however, such that having these issues also puts you at risk for developing problems with substances. In addition, there's a legal burden. So we have drug trafficking, we have violence related to crimes, and then there's the huge burden, at least in Rhode Island, I know we, we, we feel this, uh, with the juvenile justice system and kids being involved in the juvenile justice system um, due to their substance related issues. So it's, there's a huge legal um, and economic uh, consequence associated with that. And then lastly, and I think most importantly, there's a health burden that's associated with adolescent substance use. Adolescent substance use is the number one cause of disease burden in kids, and that's worldwide, and that's especially true for males. It's directly linked with the leading causes of death among youth. Um, these include accidents, homicide, as well as suicide. Um, it compromises, substance use compromises executive functioning and decision making. Having compromised um, executive functioning is also potentially a risk factor for these problems. Using then exacerbates that, um, and there's evidence that suggests that um, when you stop using, the brain doesn't necessarily go back to the way it was before. Those, those, that that um, compromised functioning could be long-lasting, which gets to the next point of irreversible uh, damage to the brain. There's also, of course, when kids are using, kids, adolescents, or overall, we'll talk about this in a moment, are high, are high risk takers. Um, developmentally, that's normative, both in humans and in all species. Um, but when kids are using, they engage in very high-risk behaviors, such as sexual risk, risk behaviors leading to HIV and other infectious diseases. Um, and what we now know over the last 10 years or so is that using substances and developing substance use problems in adolescents is one of the absolute best predictors of who's going to have a lifelong problem and struggle with addiction. So a key point here is that substance use in adolescents is not benign. It's associated with a lot of problems. Um, and it's very costly. So a recent report came out by the Surgeon General that showed that alcohol and other substance use, misuse in the U.S. has an annual cost of $442 billion. Um, so it's, so it's, 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 it's a major public health issue. So, so far what I've talked about is substance use. What I want to talk about moving forward is substance-related problems. So using substances, which depending on the substance could be somewhat developmentally normative for kids, is different than developing problems with addiction. And so as I'm sure all of you know, um, we define that, and I'm not gonna read through this for you, but essentially we define that based on the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. We're now in the fifth version of this. Um, and so essentially, you can't just necessarily use, you have to experience significant um, clinically significant impairment or distress associated with that use. And in terms of being diagnosed with what we consider to be a substance use disorder, that would mean that you show impairment in two or more of these 11 areas. And in the most recent DSM, we also then can define severity of that substance use disorder based on the number of these symptoms that you have. So when we look at last past year trends, um, of substance use disorders among kids. So this is not just use, but these are kids who meet criteria for having a substance use disorder, meaning, as we just talked about, that the use of substances is causing significant impairment in their life. 
Um, and what you see, which is maps on fairly well to, to use data actually, is that we've seen a significant decline in substance use disorders among kids over the last 15 years or so, um, which is very, very promising. It's still the case, however, that a large number of kids meet criteria for a substance use disorder. So in terms of summarizing so far, what's the scope of the problem? So 61% of kids have used alcohol by the time they get to 12th grade, so the majority of kids. About half of kids have used marijuana, and if you break this down, so part of my job, as I mentioned, is I work in school systems. If I think about a regular high school class, so in the United States, the average high school class has 24 kids in it. So if you think about high school classes across the U.S., that means five to 15 kids in every high school class in the U.S. has used substances at some point. Um, and I also want to highlight, because this is, a, this is actually a critical point, when we look at that data, this does not include 18 and 19 year olds. So, you know, as you get older, the use of, of, of drugs becomes more prevalent. And so if you include 18 and 19 year olds, and certainly we have 18 year olds in high schools, this number would be much, much higher. When you then look at problem use, about 5% of kids between the ages of 12 and 17 meet criteria for a substance use disorder. And as was mentioned before uh, this morning, 90% of those kids remain untreated. So only one in 10 kids receives treatment. And then as we're gonna get to in a few moments, it doesn't necessarily mean that the treatment they receive is evidence-based or necessarily effective. So what this translates into just for 12 to 17 year olds is that in a regular high school class, typical high school class, anyone across the country, one or two kids in that class will meet criteria for substance use disorder, will be struggling with addiction. And of those kids, in most of those classes, those kids are receiving no intervention and will not receive any intervention. Which leads us to the next component of, um, of what I want to talk about this morning, which is adolescence. And why is adolescence such a key period in the development of, of addiction? So adolescence can be defined as a period of change, a, a significant amount of change. In many, and pretty much every aspect of life, adolescents are undergoing change. They're going under, undergoing biological changes. Their brain, and we'll talk about this more in a moment, undergoes significant change during this period. They have major changes in their sleep patterns. So those of you that work with adolescents, especially if you work in schools where they get there at seven, you are very aware of the fact that they don't sleep. Um, they have significant changes in their emotional and behavioral regulation. Um, for better and for worse. Uh, they also have related to that significant cognitive changes. So there's changes in the way they think, changes in the way that they make decisions, change in their ability to really think through problems um, and navigate the environment. They also have major changes going on socially, which is where they really hyper-focus. There's changes in family relationships where there's sort of a pull away from family and gravitation more towards peer relationships. There's the onset and the beginning, depending on the age of the adolescent, of romantic relationships, romantic relationships and sexuality. There's also a transition for many kids in terms of um, living arrangements and educational settings. So going from middle school to high school, for example, is a huge transition for adolescents. It's a very stressful time for them. And then you have the period of going from, from during adolescence, from high school to college, um, or high school to the workforce, also a major, major transition. Um, one that is also oftentimes paired with a lot less parental supervision, um, which can be a huge, um, I think, liability factor for, for the escalation we see during that period. So what, is, what does research tell us about adolescence and about, and about addiction? Addiction is a brain disease, and that disease targets adolescents in a very unique way. Adolescents are highly, highly vulnerable to the effects of of alcohol and other drugs. So when we look at the most recent models that are out there, and these models are put out by the directors of the National Institutes of Drug Abuse, as well as the Institute for Alcohol, what we see is that when you use alcohol, and this is probably not news to most of you, but I'll briefly go through this, because I think it's really important when you're thinking about kids and you're thinking about their use and how it affects them. Pretty much no matter what drug you use, it's gonna increase dopaminergic activity in the brain. And so what that does is that feels good which is, to a large degree, maybe not why kids initiate use, but it is why people continue to use, at least initially. And so it causes this sharp increase in, in the way that you, you feel, which leads to further use very often. It also leads, very importantly, to an associative learning process. 
So when you're using, and this is not just kids, but it happens in kids a great deal, when you're using and you have this sort of rewarding experience, you become not only kind of conditioned to want to use more, but you also get conditioned to the cues and the stimulus in your environment or the factors in your environment that are there when you use. So in kids, that could be their friends, it could be where they're using, it could be the days of the week they're using. Adolescent use is very episodic. Even if kids are struggling with addiction, they use largely on weekends. So there are very, there are very clear environmental factors that sort of are paired with their use. And the shift actually happens in terms of this dopaminergic response where the pleasure becomes less associated with the use and more about sort of the setting factors that are at present when you typically use. So when you think about this, kids sort of shift from feeling great when they use to start to experience significant levels of craving or urges to use even in the absence of use. So when they're around the friends with whom they use, or on it's a day of the week or time of day when they typically use, if they're in a context in which they use, typically use. And so this is actually not new in the context of addiction, but I think a lot of researchers and certainly clinicians sort of question whether that is applicable to kids. Over time, what happens in addition to this is the brain becomes less sensitive to the actual non-drug-related cues. So the, you start to become hyper-focused on the pleasurable effects of alcohol and other drugs, hyper-focused on cues that um, signify that use, and much less focused on other things that maybe you typically would have found rewarding, but now not so much, maybe more pro-social activities. And this, uh, the culmination of this sort of leads to um, less motivation for everyday activities, school, relationships, goals, and heightened, heightened focus on using substances. Meanwhile, as if that wasn't necessarily bad enough, what happens when you're using substances over time, and we've already mentioned this, is that so your executive functioning becomes compromised. So your ability to think through problems, which by the way is already compromised in kids, um, is now further compromised. And this is clinically significant for those of us that work with kids, we know this. So they don't necessarily make the best decisions, and this becomes even more so when we start talking about co-occurring conditions. Um, but once you start to use, the effects of the, of, of the substance on the brain is that your executive functioning is not so intact. And so you're not necessarily making the best decisions. So even when you want to reduce, even when you want to cut back, it's very hard for kids to do that, and certainly adults, in the context of um, having these strong urges, being in environments that sort of trigger um, cravings to want to use. They may have the best intention, and I think for a lot of us that work with kids, I believe when we're in sessions, I, when they leave, they, I think they have the best intention. It's kind of like I have the best intention not to sit on the couch at the end of the day and eat a bag of potato chips, but, but it doesn't necessarily work out. So in the moment, I think things happen. And in kids' moments, there's a lot of social factors, a lot of peer influences, and then you throw addiction into that. Um, and it's a very, very, very challenging um, situation. So why are adolescent brains particularly vulnerable to drugs? Well, the adolescent brain is changing. So when we look at sort of brain, um, um, sort of neuronal changes in the brain, you see a lot that happens with little kids. And then not so much. So by the time you are hit adolescence, your brain is pretty much the size that it's going to be. Your brain is pretty much, you got all the parts that you need. But what needs to happen, and this is really, really critical, is you need to really strengthen the connections between those parts. So you, what, what happens is the brain does this thing where it starts to pair back and really strengthen connections between regions of the brain that are really important. Like, for example, the connection between how we feel, sort of the reward and emotional centers of the brain, and how we think. Um, that particular link is not especially strong for kids, and that's a huge thing that happens during adolescence. In addition, what you do see is the brain's not maturing at the same time, and so it's not as though everything sort of comes online and everything now we've, all these sort of pathways become fine-tuned in, in, in a simultaneous fashion. What happens is reward pathways, your sensitivity to, to reward and pleasurable things sort of comes online first while your executive functioning comes on maybe not so first. And so what happens is that you have these kids who from a reward perspective have their, their foot on the gas, like they think this is great, but the brake isn't working so well. So they don't really have that inhibition. And this is true for all, as we know, kids vary in this, but I think it's for those of us that work with kids or have, have kids, um, it's certainly something we see in probably all adolescents. Um, so kids do vary in this, but when you use substances, what we see is that substances are, are 
attacking, for lack of a better word, the parts of the brain that exactly govern those functions. So a kid's brain naturally is trying to really reconfigure and do what it needs to do, and then you introduce the toxic effects of, of, of alcohol and other drugs, the neurotoxic effects, and it starts to really mess with that process. So when we talk about the brain disease model of addiction, how well does it apply to kids? So how well does this model apply to adolescents? Um, I've, you know, I, again, I, I, I walk in different circles. I do a lot of clinical work. Over half my time is spent directly working with kids, and, how, and about half my time is spent directly doing research. Um, and there's a lot of question about how much this stuff really, or how well this stuff really applies to kids. And part of the question stems from, from a research perspective, and I won't spend too much time on this, um, but, but part, of, part of the reason is that we can't study the acute effects of these substances in kids. In adults, it's easy. I started off studying adults. I bring them in the lab, I give them drugs, and we measure what happens to them, and we see how they feel. You can't do that with kids. So what we've had to do is we've had to rely on research with, with, with animals. Um, and animal research has been very, very compelling. And, and within the alcohol field, and I'm going to just describe the alcohol stuff to give you a sense, but people have done this work with marijuana as well. Um, this is mostly work by Linda Spear, who's a pioneer in this area. Um, she's in New York, upstate New York. Um, what we see in rodents is, out of the gate, adolescent rodents will drink two or three times more than, ad than adult rodents. Everything else being equal. Adolescents just self-initiate and consume alcohol a lot more. In addition, what we see, and this is critically important, that rodents are less sensitive Adolescent rodents are less sensitive to the negative effects of using these substances, alcohol, marijuana, other drugs. So they don't really have the negative effects. They don't really have sort of the psychomotor slowing. They don't really have the sedative effects. But what they do show is a strong hypersensitivity to the pleasurable effects. So they become very, from a rat, they become very um, you know, socially engaged, very, very wrestling around in the cage, much more so than what you see in adults. And so what you see during this period is, at least from animal research, is that kids seem to be hypersensitive to the pleasurable effects of alcohol, at least, and other drugs, but relatively insensitive to some of the other negative effects. And they're more likely to just use more um, if given the opportunity. This leads to an important question. Do these animal findings actually apply to humans? Um, it's one thing to show these things in rats, and it certainly is nice that it fits with the leading theoretical models of addiction, but that's not to say that what you see in animals necessarily applies to actual human kids. And so one of the things that my lab has done over the last way too long, 15 years or so, um, I can tell that because the picture looks nice. It's like an iPhone and it looks fancy. We started off with like these big Palm Pilots with a stylus. Many of you may not even know what that was, um, which not only the technology was sort of crazy, but when you gave it to people, they had no idea what to do with it. Now, now kids, especially kids, um, this is like this is their whole life. Their entire life exists on a phone. Um, in any case, so what we did is I got this idea to sort of, um, if I can't administer alcohol to kids or drugs to kids in a lab, which I don't want to, ethically and morally, it's not okay. If I can't do that, there is a way to capture this information otherwise. And so what we did is we have kids have carry around a phone um, throughout the day and answer questions throughout the day about how they're doing, what the, who they're with, how they feel, if they're craving for alcohol or other things. Um, so they fill out reports on four occasions. They fill it out every morning when they wake up. They fill out random assessments throughout the day that are truly random, just to sort of get a snapshot of what their day looks like in terms of, again, who they're with, what they're doing, how they feel. Um, and then we also ask them to fill out reports before and after they use substances. Um, and my research is focused on alcohol and marijuana. And again, the focus here is to be able to see how do they feel when they use? Um, do they actually experience pleasurable effects when they use? Which oddly enough, other than asking them retrospectively in surveys, we don't really know. And so this is just what a data stream looks like in terms of from three random participants. It was an alcohol study. And so what you see over the course of a month, they do this every day. Kids in our studies do it every day for anywhere from a month to three or six months. Um, and, and they do it very, very well, and then you actually don't see any sort of getting tired of doing it. They do it every day, they do it well, and they maintain that for months. 
Um, essentially, though, what's important here is just to show you how the data sort of lay out. What you see is in the morning, there are random assessment. In the morning, they get up, they fill out a report. Then the white dots sort of show you they fill out information throughout the day, no matter where they are. And then the red dots show you substance use. So in this case, you see that at some point, the second one, participant B, sort of stopped using substances around day 20. Um, not so much for A and not so much for C. So what we showed, and really what the graph is probably less important, but what, what I want to show you is, is that what we find is that when kids use, so what we did is we did this with adults, we did this with kids, and what we find is that when kids use, they are much more stimulated when they drink than adults are. When they start to use alcohol, they're getting much more bang from their buck. And I want to also add that the kids and the adults, because of the kids that we're recruiting for, I do a lot of research on medication trials for alcohol and marijuana for kids, these are kids that were coming into a trial, wanted to reduce their use, most of them at criteria for a substance use disorder. So it's not merely that adults are just using more and have more substance use problems. These kids are pretty severe. And what you see is that they are more, they are hypersensitive, especially early on in terms of the experience that they get from using um, alcohol. In addition, um, they also report more craving. Um, when they use compared to adults. And really what's important and what this research allows you to really test is does it matter? So if they're, if they're experiencing more stimulation and more craving, who cares? Is it really just that they experience it? Well, it's not that. Because the more that they experience at least craving, the more they're gonna drink that day. So within that episode, getting a, a good bang for your buck early on doesn't mean, wow, I feel great, I'm gonna actually maybe slow down. For kids, that's like a, game on sign, and they just drink a lot more when they, when they feel much more stimulated. So what I did after this, and actually I didn't do, but I was invited to collaborate with Linda Spear, who does all this work with, with, with animals. Um, and, sorry, I just got a sign saying the computer's gonna restart, but hopefully it doesn't. Um, so um, so what, what Linda Spear did, um, and I was not, had no involvement in setting this up, but I did have involvement writing up the paper, is she got around this, rather than giving kids phones, she set up research stations outside of bars in a college town in New York, and she got kids as they were coming out of bars and had them fill out all kinds of questionnaires and get their blood alcohol concentrations. And what she saw, the take home message here, is she saw the exact same thing that we saw, which is that kids, younger kids, kids who are in 17 to 20 year old range, Underage drinkers get a lot more bang for their buck when they use than, than older um, kids. And the older kids here are like, you know, 21, 20, uh, 21 to 32. So they're not particularly old, but they are older than the younger kids. The next thing we, that I've looked at is whether or not craving matters. So do kids actually experience craving when they're not using? I, and I started to look at this because a lot of the feedback I got when I would talk about this was that, well, kids don't crave. Clinically, I would hear kids say they crave all the time. Clinically, I would hear, because they knew I was doing this research at Brown, I'm in, so I'm in session, and they're like, can you just give me a drug to not make me want to use? Um, that would be great. Um, and so I had anecdotally this idea that kids do crave. And, oops. And so what we found is that, in fact, they do. So when kids are in the environment and they're not using, and they're in the absence of any sort of other drugs, what we see is that when they're in the environment and there's cues in that environment, in this case, I'm just looking at cues that are associated with like actual, do you see alcohol? And we may think kids don't see this, but in social media, kids see this and they see it a lot. So, so when they see these things, do they actually have more craving? Which we know is predictive of more use. And in fact, they do. Um, have significantly more craving. And what we also see is that the craving they get is directly related to how much, how many problems they have. So kids who have more alcohol problems experience more craving when they're in these contexts, which is probably in some ways, I would argue, sort of um, precipitates um, or perpetuates the continuation of use. So some key points so far which I probably didn't need to convince this audience necessarily, but adolescence, substance use is on the decline overall, not so much for marijuana, but it remains a public health major concern. Um, it's associated with a lot of negative effects. And adolescence is a period in life where we really should be focused because it, it sort of creates a perfect storm for the development of addiction. The adolescent brain is uniquely set up um, to really be sensitive to the negative effects of drugs and alcohol and really to promote the onset of addiction. So next we're gonna to turn to the next part of the talk is going to look at co-occurring disorders. 
So what's a co-occurring disorder? I think probably this group of people knows this. So co-occurring disorder is a very simple thing. When you have a psychiatric disorder, and I should say a non-substance use psychiatric disorder because substance use is in fact in the context of a psychiatric disorder, but when you have a non-substance use psychiatric disorder and substance abuse, and that occurs within the same person, um, which for adolescents, as we'll see, is quite common. So when you look at the prevalence of this in kids, if you just look sort of nationally, how many kids have a co-occurring disorder? About 32% of kids who would meet criteria for a substance use disorder um, have a co-occurring disorder. But when you look at kids who are coming into treatment, so the sort of kids that you and I are gonna see, that we do see every day, almost all those kids have a co-occurring substance use disorder. 80%, and I feel like that number must be low, based, maybe it's just based on my practice, um, but 80% of kids come in with at least one or more co-occurring disorders. And so what's the association? Dr. Cameron is gonna talk, uh, I think, a little bit about this, although he's done a lot of research on this, so maybe um, he'll, he'll work it into his talk. Uh, essentially, depression. So what are the childhood risk factors for developing? So these are things that onset prior to substance use and are predictive of who's gonna develop a substance use problem. Well, most things, right? So depression, ADHD. Initially, there was some question about whether ADHD really only confers liability in the context of having another disruptive behavior disorder like conduct disorder or ODD. Recent research suggests that's not, case, not the case. It actually um, stands alone as a risk factor for developing a substance use problem. Oppositional defiant disorder, conduct disorder, trauma, um, bipolar disorder, as well as anxiety, although the link between anxiety and developing a substance use problem seems more linked to drug use than it does to alcohol use. And if you look at it on the flip side, what's the relationship between adolescent onset substance use and then developing mental health problems? Well, what you see, as we've sort of mentioned, is that adolescent substance use is associated with a myriad executive functioning problems that may not go away. Cannabis is associated with persistent problems. You smoking cannabis heavily, regularly, quadruples your risk of psychosis. This is a huge interest in the research community. It doubles your risk for depression and anxiety. It's associated with the onset of suicidal thoughts and attempts and actually completion. Um, Antisocial behavior the binge purge side of eating disorders, as well as PTSD. One thing I want to point out, though, is that just because they're associated doesn't mean that there's a cause. So there's very limited evidence to say that being, for example, having conduct disorder or having ADHD causes substance use. We don't really have evidence to support that, but they are strongly linked. So what are some possible explanations for the link between these co-occurring conditions? One is adolescence is a vulnerable period. So the majority of adolescents, the half of psychiatric non-substance use psychiatric problems will occur or have an onset before age 15. 25% more, or should I say up to 75% of all psychiatric problems will have an onset before age 24. So the majority of substance use, the majority of psychiatric problems are onset, have an onset during adolescence. This could be in part because there are common brain regions um, and neural circuits that are associated with these things. One of the things that we find in psychiatric research is that someone will come out with a new gene or a new area of the brain, and so there's a lot of research in this area, and what you find is it's linked to everything. So it's not as though you know, a certain genetic risk is specific to alcohol or specific to other substances. It also confers liability for all kinds of things. Um, it's also the case that recreational alcohol and drug use um, before it becomes an addiction, could also have um, major effects on altering gene expression or transcription. And those effects could then lead to long-term problems not only with addiction, but also lead to problems with psychiatric issues. There's also common genetic factors that could be at play. Um, addiction is, uh, research has clearly shown this over the years. 50% of the, of the risk for addiction is associated with genetics. And then there's also shared environment. So pretty much any environmental context that puts you at risk for developing psychiatric problems also puts you at risk for developing um, substance abuse problems. When we look at the rates of co-occurring disorders um, across people, um, across people who come into um, substance abuse treatment programs, 80%, um, up to 80% meet criteria for conduct disorder, up to 50% meet criteria for ADHD, and up to 50% meet criteria for major depressive disorder. And I just put sort of the top, um, the top players in, in this slide. Um, it's also the case, and I think, again, speaking to the choir for those of you that work with kids, how often is that kids co show up with, you know, they're abusing pot and they have ADHD only? 
Not often. So it's usually a combination. They have ADHD, they've had a major depressive episode, they're using substances. So it's actually more common that you have multiple problems when you show up for treatment. Why is this a problem? So why is this important that kids would show up with co-occurring problems? Kids with co-occurring problems start using drugs earlier. They also use heavier. They're more likely to develop dependence. They have more or greater amounts of family dysfunction. They have worse school engagement, more legal problems, and they tend to be younger. So kids who, and this is a very sad part of it in terms of what we see every day, kids who come in with the most severe comorbid problems tend to be on the younger side, and research supports that. It's also the case, very importantly, that they have poorer treatment outcomes. So the majority of, which is interesting, because who are the kids that we're treating that don't have co-occurring problems, right? Um, the ones that show up for treatment, it's 80% of kids. But those 80% do worse um, than, than others. They relapse earlier. Um, they have greater utilization of outpatient and inpatient treatment over time. Um, and, and, and among these, aside from early relapse is not good, but I think the big point here that I think we can all sort of agree to is keeping kids in treatment is tough. Keeping kids engaged in treatment is a huge, huge challenge. And kids with co-occurring problems, they can be a particular challenge. And so we need to make sure that what we're giving them as a treatment is the most effective that we can, that we maximize the time that we do have with them, and we do all that we can do to maximize the time that we have with them. So we want to make the time we have with them to be the most effective, and we want to be spending time in a way that increases the likelihood that they, they will want to or will at least come back. Integrated treatments, um, which is basically the um, very simple concept, is basically when you combine um, under one roof psychiatric care with substance abuse care. Um, they yield better outcomes. And what's important is that while most treatment programs in the US accept teens with comorbidity, pretty much all of them, less than half, or about half, actually provide co-occurring treatment. They address the mental health need. That is not to say that it's an integrated care model, but it is the case that they would, they would address the mental health need. So when you look at, and this is not just kids, when you look across the country and you look at you know, the percent of people who are showing up to uh, treatment centers who have co-occurring conditions, what you see is in the Northeast, in our region, um, there's a, it's particularly prevalent um, relative to the rest of the US, almost all of the rest of the US. And what was alarming to me is what you also see is this, this slide shows you based on, so the darker the blue, I am colorblind, but I'm pretty sure that's blue. The darker the blue, what you'll see is that, I think hopefully, otherwise I got this all backwards, and this is not impactful. Anyway, um, but I think the darker the blue, the more percentage of the treatment center, the greater percentage of treatment centers that are actually addressing co-occurring conditions. And while we have a huge um, increase in the Northeast, what you see is we have a real dearth of treatment centers that are actually addressing this in the Northeast. And this is, again, not just kids, but it, it, it certainly would apply to kids as well. So the last part of, of my talk that I want to focus on for the last few minutes that I have is what, um, what are the best available treatments? And I'm going to focus on sort of what can we do? So what's the take-home message here? What can we do with kids? So we sort of reviewed that adolescent substance use is prevalent. It's not just a pattern that we see in the US, it's national, it's, it's worldwide. The pattern seems to be sort of related not only socially, but also to what's going on in the brain at that time. And that what's going on in the brain at the time puts kids at great risk. Um, and I didn't mention this, but one of the things that is really effective in terms of at least a prevention approach is if you can just push back the onset of substance use. If you can just get kids to start using a little bit later, it has a lot of benefit long-term for kids, which I think again speaks to the brain's developing, there's a lot going on. If we can keep that development sort of intact and sort of protected from the neurotoxic effects of substances, things look a lot better. So in terms of interventions, there's a number of interventions you can focus on. There's universal prevention approaches, there's early intervention approaches, both of those sort of target people when they're not necessarily on the severe end of, of having an addiction problem. And then there's sort of the treatment, that's sort of the actual focus. Once kids have problems and they come in for treatment, what can we do? For my presentation this morning, I'm gonna be focused on the smallest circle. What can we do in terms of treatment and what does research tell us? As a, as a clinician, and also as a researcher, and definitely as a parent, when I think about 
evidence-based interventions, and this isn't necessarily specific to addiction, I think of four things. I think of what are the general effects? Does treatment even work? So if I have a random condition, does treatment for this condition actually work? Then if I find out that treatment does work, what I wanna know is do certain treatments work better than other treatments? What's the specificity? Because obviously we want the best treatment, right? Especially if it's us and we're, or if we're, we're, we're practitioners and we're giving you know, treatment to kids. We wanna make sure we're giving whatever is the best. Um, but then also what I want to know, and this is something researchers oftentimes, depending on their context, are, are afraid to ask. Okay, so it works, but how much, like, so what's the magnitude of that effect? How effective is the best available intervention? Does it actually yield huge effects, or is it, are we saying that it's statistically significant, but in practice not so much? And then the last thing that I would ask is how do effective interventions exert those beneficial effects? For whom do they work? So when you think about medicine, non-psychiatric care, although more recently in psychiatric care, maybe cancer is a good example, this whole idea of precision medicine. How do we really identify who is gonna benefit most from what particular treatment? For this morning's talk, I'm gonna focus on the first three for adolescent substance use. We know very, very little about number four. Um, I do a lot of research on number four, so I'm happy to talk about it afterwards if anyone's interested. Um, but unfortunately, we, we don't really have a lot to say in terms of evidence to support that. So the figure here shows, for those of you that are research sort of savvy, sort of this is a recent paper, a fairly recent paper, um, which was actually very, very good, by Emily Tanner Smith, that looked at what works. And, and what she did with her colleagues was looked at, so if we look at kids before treatment, and then we look at how they're doing after treatment, do kids get better? And the short answer to that is that yes, on the whole, pretty much no matter what you do, kids get better. So that's great. Um, only one treatment type showed significant improvements, um, all but one showed go significant improvements over time. So the one that doesn't seem to work is practice as usual. So and that, of course, in research could be any number of things um, when, we're, when we're studying that. But practice as usual doesn't seem to produce much of a benefit over time. The one that does stand out though is showing the most benefit. They all, other than practice as usual, they all show significant benefit, but the one that really shows the most is family interventions. So what's the comparative effectiveness? So when we look at different interventions that have been tried, and I'll get into what those are, what works best? This is a very complicated question because when you wanna know what works best, the ideal way to do this is to take everything that you think might work and compare it to the same thing. So if we have four, five interventions, in this case it's three, we compare all three of these interventions to one sort of standard intervention and we say, okay, well which one is better than the standard intervention? The problem is, is that this is definitely not how adolescent research has, has gone in terms of substance use. Everything is compared to everything else and everything else sort of changes a little bit from study to study, so it's incredibly difficult to gauge what's more effective than something else. So in terms of what's the most effective relative to something else, we, we don't have a lot to say about that. What we can say is there are four interventions that seem to show a lot of promise. The one that shows the most promise and the strongest evidence is family-based therapy. There are a number of family-based therapies out there. Um, Research-wise, there isn't a lot of evidence to say that one is better than the other. They all seem to do fairly well. Um, and this is based on the idea that the family is the most profound and lasting influence. Um, they focus on communication, cohesiveness, problem solving. Um, in addition, there's motivational enhancement therapy which was really grounded in addiction from the beginning with adults, which basically uses sort of interviewing strategies that helps a person move along from being not really sure about change, which, as we can all sort of attest to, that's pretty much every adolescent that we see um, who comes in and is not, they're not necessarily gung-ho, obviously oftentimes someone else is gung-ho for their change, but they're not entirely convinced that change is needed. And so kind of approaching it from a motivational enhancement, sort of questioning and kind of reflecting and helping the, helping the client sort of understand um, how their substance use compares to others and sort of the changes that they might want to consider. That shows some effectiveness. In addition, behavior therapy um, shows effectiveness, um, which is basically, I'm sure we all know behavior therapy, the goal is to reinforce desirable behaviors, eliminate unwanted mal maladaptive behaviors, contingency management would sort of fall loosely into this category. Um, focus on teaching skills, focusing on targeting new ways of coping. Um, that seems to work. And then lastly is cognitive behavioral therapy, um, which um, as we all probably know is pretty much behavior therapy, but you add in this component of the way you think actually influences the way that you feel and influences the way that you act, which in turn influences the way that you think. <laughs> 
So then the last question related to this is, so how effective are outpatient treatments? And I think for most of us, let's just focus all the way on the column, all the way on the right. So this is the best available intervention. So if we take how effective are our best available interventions, what you see is we have room to improve. So for alcohol, what we see, and for those of you that like statistics, I included those, but I'm not gonna really talk about those. What you see is a reduction on average of from two days per month to about 0.6 days per month. That's like the best intervention we have for alcohol. When you look at marijuana, it's reducing from 13 days on average of marijuana use to about six days of marijuana use. For other substances, what you see is reducing from 3.5 days to about 2.7 days, so not a huge impact. Um, and for mixed use, what you see is a, reduce, a reduction of about half of days. So if someone was using mixed substances on 10 days in a month, they're now using on five. And again, this is our best available interventions. What I think is important, given that no one intervention seems to really stand out, with the exception to some degree of family therapy, are sort of what are some of the key components of intervention? What are the things that you really want to be sure you're doing with kids? So one of the things is you want to build a therapeutic alliance using a non-judgmental approach. Uh-oh. Um, so, so this is critical, and I think any of us that work and practice with kids, you learn this very, very, very quickly if it's not something you already naturally do. So you really have to take time to get to know a kid, to build trust with a kid, and to get them to feel as though there's somebody that they can go to and talk about what's going on. You also want to assess stages of change, and I kind of alluded to this a little bit earlier. You know, so the stages of change model says not everybody that shows up for treatment is saying, yep, let's jump in there and let's change our behavior. Let's, I want to reduce how much I use. And so, I'll just talk you through this. So within the stages of change model, you know, we have these stages, you have pre-contemplation, contemplation, I don't know them off the top of my head. Um, they were on a nice slide though. Um, and so, essentially, you know, you wanna meet the client where they are and not assume necessarily that a kid comes in and isn't ready to change, but you wanna assess that and you wanna sort of see where they're at so you can really intervene at a place that is meaningful to them. That kind of, that doesn't sound like preaching because the one thing that is not effective with kids, and it's, we say this about kids, but I would say it's also really not effective with adults, is preaching at them. It's, it's not particularly useful. I think listening, reflective listening, hearing them, hearing what their concerns are, hearing what their parents' concerns are, which is oftentimes very different than their concerns, um, I think is really important. I also think providing feedback on risks and level of use is really important. One of the things that we, we do know, and it was research that's recently been done that I reviewed earlier, kids have a very kind of crazy idea of the risks associated with use. They actually don't think it's very necessarily useful at all, uh, risky at all. In addition, providing normative feedback, not only about risks, but about how much they're using relative to their peers. So people, not just kids, get into this mindset and they have their peer group and they're sort of functioning and they think everyone in their peer group sort of reflects the world. So doesn't everybody drink alcohol five days a week? No, not everyone who's 14 drinks alcohol five days a week, but in their peer group, maybe that's the case and that's their reality. So providing them with some normative feedback that really helps them understand, there's the slide, um, understand um, how their use fits in. Now I have done this probably a thousand times, more than a thousand times. Every time, kids are like, you're making this up. This is not real. This is, you know, where, who did you talk to to get this information? Um, and it takes a little bit of conv convincing, especially college students. And it takes, it takes a little bit of, you know, I think compassionate sort of listening and convincing to, to demonstrate, no, in fact, your use level is a little bit different and higher. We also want to teach coping skills. We want to set goals. Setting goals is really important. Um, we want to develop a plan for dealing with situations, high-risk situations, because they do seem, research shows, very relevant to kids. It's been a part of treatment forever, um, but I think more recently, we've demonstrated and published some work that suggests it's very relevant for kids. And you really, really want to involve the family. And I know for all of us, sometimes that's like, yes, that's great. Let's involve the family. And other families, we're like, whoa, let's... Is that really necessarily the way we need to go? But I think it's important from different angles. Sometimes it's helping families understand what the problem is, and then it, sometimes it really is helping families understand their impact, how their behavior and their own substance use is impacting their kids. Their substance use with their kids is impacting their kids and having problematic effects. 
And so sort of the family piece, I think, looks different a lot of times based on the family. But no matter where on the continuum the family falls, I do think it's important to address that. And research would support that. Here's a, here's a quick slide, because I think I'm getting to the end, but here's a quick study that we had done, and there are other studies like this, and the specifics of it don't really matter, but the take-home message here are that we had done a study, and I was interested in, there's a gene that people see seems to be related to alcohol use problems, and so we wanted to know whether it was relevant in kids, and the story here is that having this gene did put you at risk for developing problems, but it didn't put everyone at risk for developing problems. It put kids at risk for developing problems who spent a lot of time with deviant peers, and it put kids at risk when their parents didn't really monitor their behavior. When parents monitored the kid's behavior who had this genetic allele, the gene didn't really confer any risk at all. Um, they looked just like kids who didn't have that, that risky allele. And I think that that, and there's been other studies, I'm just showing my own for my own self-serving purposes, but because um, I was able to pull the graph easily. But I think, I think that the, the key here is, is that interventions with families can matter. And getting families, not only from a family functioning and dynamic perspective, but when I'm working with kids, especially when I'm working in schools, because one of the things I love as a psychologist being in schools is I see the same kids every day for years. Sometimes from like, we start out in fourth grade and we end up going to graduation. And so I see these kids every day. And so in the moment, in real time, I'm able to say, you know, we talked about how telling your math teacher where they needed to go because they asked you to turn on your homework may not be effective. And you're able to really intervene at that moment. And I think with families, what families can do if we, if we teach them is being able to really serve as those executive functioning, serve as sort of a surrogate frontal lobe for kids, where they're able to help kids navigate and make decisions that their brains are not developmentally ready to make. So they're taking on all this responsibility. Kids are growing up faster and faster every, every year, I think. And so they're taking on all this responsibility that they're not necessarily equipped to deal with. And so helping parents understand that monitoring their kids and really being an advocate and sort of a, like I said, a frontal lobe sort of a surrogate for them, I think can have a huge, huge impact. And I see it in my own work, day-to-day -day working with kids. So this leads us to an integrated care model. And I think that, so in terms of integrated care, um, there are important reasons why we uh, want to do this first is that you want to first establish a good baseline. So in order to do integrated care, you have to identify the kid has a co-occurring condition. I also think that this serves not only to identify a co-occurring condition, but it also serves to get a good baseline measure. So in evidence-based practice, we're not only taking what the research says, but we're also monitoring from an evidence perspective what we're doing to evaluate whether it's effective for a specific kid. And so getting that good baseline is important. I also think that it's important to look at from a stage-wise perspective. And so from this perspective, you're engaging kids where they are. So it's not so you go through all four stages, but you don't just jump into active treatment if a kid is not ready for that. You might start off forming a trusting relationship, which I think you always sort of need to do. But whether you spend too much time on motivating for change or not depends on where the kid is. And the other piece, which was already talked about this morning, is that you really want to have a comprehensive services from a multidisciplinary team. You want it to be one-stop shopping. So kids already are not great about treatment. You know, dropout is high. You start having to go to multiple appointments and multiple days of the week. That becomes cumbersome for families. In reality, it's cumbersome. It's not as though families are not necessarily motivated. It's tough. You have two working parents. Kids are busy. Parents are busy. It's tough. So the more you can make it a, a user-friendly service, I think the higher likelihood a kid is going to actually benefit from that. So some take home messages. I only have two more slides, I think. One is um, you want to make your treatments developmentally appropriate. Treatments seem to work, but you really can't take a treatment that works with adults and just blindly you know, implement that with a child. Therapeutic alliance is really, really key with adolescents. They are very guarded, and they are very guarded when it comes to adults in particular. And so that it requires work on our part. Understand that's where they're coming from and be able to, 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 to kind of navigate ourselves or manage ourselves to really build that trust and not expect that they're just going to necessarily trust us. We also want to understand major components of treatments that work. Treatments do work. Not necessarily one better than the other. So what are the components of interventions that we think are really, really critical that we should be doing? I think it's critical to use appropriate instruments for screening and assessment, and I recently I just talked about why. You want to match level of treatment with severity of the problem. You also want to prepare to deal with comorbidity because that's going to be what you're doing most of the time. And you want to shape treatment to maximize engagement. Um, understand stages of change, take a motivational enhancement approach, 
and engage with parents. Here are some resources for integrated treatments that you may all be familiar with, and I, these slides will be available. Um, but these are some, some, some great resources that are out there, and they're free, um, that you can pull from. The one all the way on the right, Integrated Treatment for Co-Occurring Disorders, is a huge, huge set of documents that lays out basically step by step exactly how to build an integrated treatment service, and it's a great um, resource. Um, SAMHSA also has TIPS protocols. Some of them are directly relevant to this, some of them are not, they're all great. Um, but to be able to rely on those about what's the best in terms of evidence-based practice. So the take-home message, substance use and misuse among kids remains high, and it has a lot of negative problems. It definitely interrupts normal development. Adolescence is a key to period in the development of addiction. Um, and I think we all can, we all see that. Um, and I think it's really important to really harness that. I, I do feel like the majority of treatment resources in the US don't go to kids. And I feel like if more resources went to adolescents, we would need fewer resources in it for adults. Treatment also should be developmentally tailored. And integrated care is really, really essential. Um, not just addressing substance use and expecting doing that alone will have an impact, and not necessarily just targeting depression and thinking if you just get a kid to be less depressed, they'll stop using substances. And I have to acknowledge the large number of people who have supported me. This is people I've worked with, some of these people in my lab, other than just collaborators I've worked with over the years. Thank you very much. And I